Okay. So yeah, let's talk about where you are and then some of your questions. Yeah, well, um, maybe real quick. So <laughs> I've been, I finally, you know, I've been forcing myself to to really get it going, you know, and I watched all the videos again and I realized like doing it all in one big push made everything make a lot more sense. And so yesterday I went down and finally took a, a, a picture um, of a specimen, you know, and I, um, it turned out pretty good. Um, I don't know if you want to take a look at it. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. I, the the one issue I had, um, let's see, oops, was you know I was following the PTP guide, um, and I did the settings in the table, and those settings resulted in the individual images being pretty dark, okay. and so I, I started playing with the flash settings. I guess what what I got kind of confused about. Um, was that, you know, so we have the the remote flashes. And so there's the part that goes on the camera and then there's the individual flash units. And I wasn't sure, like they're like on the the part that attaches to the camera, there was an option to change, you know, the, the flash output, you know, like 164, 132, but then on the individual flashes, there's the same thing. And I wasn't seeing those being linked up. And I think that's right. I just, I wasn't sure what, which of those I was supposed to set to the value that's in the table so the chat the, so it works just like a two-way radio so they are a um they have channels so um basically what you want to do is actually go through and manually change the channel on the transmitter and then change the channel on the the individual units the flash heads once they're synced then all you need to do is control the main transmitter you don't ever have to touch the flash heads again other than to turn them on and to turn them off Okay. So I had, I mean, it, it must've been set up because the flashes were working. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're yeah. on the right frequency. Yeah. yeah. But then I, it just, it just seemed weird. Like I would, you know, I, I looked at the, the transmitter and I saw what I think was the, the flash power and I would change that and it wouldn't change what was on the flashes. Um, sometimes I think if, if you just fired it up, you, I would just power everything off and then power everything back on. Okay. Um, just because it, it may have just synced for the first time when you had them on. Okay. Um, yeah, but once you kind of power them back on and the batteries are good, then you should just be able to control on the transmitter. Okay. Um, also, if, if, if perhaps maybe you changed one of the settings on the flash head that maybe knocked it out, um, until you, you, you know, you, I think reset it. Yeah. So that could happen as well. Yeah, that might be, I definitely initially did the flashes and then, mm -hmm. and then I went to the transmitter and I was like, oh, this probably is where the master is. And I changed that. And then I saw it wasn't changing the others. No, I didn't. And I didn't um, change it on and off, but yeah. I guess in that case, I mean, could there have been something where like the two different settings was causing some actually different output than, than like if there was a master setting, because I just... I that could be. Can I just confirm that you you almost you you were certainly using the camera on manual mode and the flash was on manual mode as well, right? Yes. Good. Okay. Okay. So that's a great starting point. Um, and then yeah, so it could have been out of whack. The next thing then is uh, just light diffusion. It depends on how far away your flash heads are. So obviously, um, you know, just like a flashlight, if you're far away from your source, you're gonna be touching you know, a lot less light is going to be touching what you're pointing at than if you're right up against it. So yeah. sometimes it's really good to bring in the flash heads as close as you can to that global diffuser and then shoot them through. Um, and then again, the most important part is to not let any direct light from that surface of the flash head, you know, have line of sight to the sample. I think we talked about that at, at ESA. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. I don't know if the image I shared, I don't know if, if I mean, I, it definitely, it, it gets a little bit brighter than it should have been, I think. Okay. It, oh, it did looks, you, oh, you shared it? Oh, I see. Yeah, Sorry. in the chat. It looks, if you get open to me, it, to me, the lighting looks pretty good and diffuse. There's a few spots that are a little bright. And so I, I, I mean, admittedly, I, I didn't play too much with the, um, well, so two things I did is actually I bought some felt and I wanted, I kind of like a white background um, okay. for individual, like for just the, the stacked images, because that allows us to like, I think easier, more easily crop out the background, like in, in Photoshop. Um, sure. I mean, maybe there's other ways to do it, like a black background. So that's one thing I did is I used this white felt, um, and um, yeah. and I I did notice. I mean, I wondered if if you know I tried to get the the flashes pretty close and kind of you know up 
kind of at the top and and kind of facing where there's that little hole in the the the, the diffuser the um the shroud and uh oh yeah your your light yeah. here is your light here is good i i think it's very good you're 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 very well diffuse um your stacking is excellent because there's not much uh you know there's no ghosting effects the only thing is is this is where sometimes people that have been doing this a long time prefer the neutral gray is uh the hairs like around like the upper thorax you can see how they kind of blend into the background yeah. um they're just not getting the contrast that's necessary and a lot of people favor a gray in order to pull out that contrast um the other thing too is there's that effect that hymenoptera specimens have where the wings have that more oil slick like rainbow effect if they're if they're contrasted against a darker background whereas they just appear transparent against the white background. So you can see the wing kind of fades out against the white. So that's the that's the main reason why I think people in taxonomy that are taking it just really like the gray. Um, but at the same time, I'm also just going to share my screen so I can kind of talk about it as well. Um, uh, I think I, everything changed on here. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. Sure. It could be these different needs for like um yeah, there could there could be different needs. So like I I personally I still tend to um I'm an impar I'm impartial. So I, I'm obviously not like right. um actually, I don't even know what I did with all of my felt. Um, I had them all on a case. Um yeah. But but t typically I tend to prefer like the really earthy colors. Um, like bra I I actually really love card like a cardboard background, like that color of cardboard. If you were to put cardboard back there, uh, I I know that it's not talked about or done very much in entomology, but that brown I find from entomological specimens across the board contrasts excellently against wings, hairs, pollen grains, antenna, like all of those materials. Um, brown. Brown. Yeah. Like I think if you were to, if you were to reshoot this, brown. just put a, yeah, honestly, just cut a piece of cardboard from a, an Amazon box or something that you did recently, yeah. just put that behind it and let me know what you think. Cause personally, I think that that is just an excellent, um, color. So like I, I have, uh, I actually have, oh, it's actually right here. <laughs> so I, I, um, these are contrasted against Brown. So this is actually, I think probably just a cardboard backdrop, something that's really small. Oh. Um, and this this is tiny. This is probably I don't. Uh, this is a okay. So ten x objective. So this is a tip of a point mount. It's it's obviously not a very well, uh, you know, the well mounted specimen. Uh, yeah, the glue has like changed, but you can kind of see how the hairs here and everything. Uh, if I were to just zoom in, is really um, contrasted really well. You can even see the color changes and the color hues textured uh, mm. of the hairs. So that's an example, I think, of like the brown background. I, I think we also have, um, yeah, the, these were done against brown. Um, I think I have like an uh, an ant um, album, well, Hymenoptera album, but there's an ant that we butted up against brown. Um, so you can see this is like Matt Buffington's gray. And the gray does do a decent job of kind of showing the hairs. But at the same time, the gray is going to be a darker gray if it's not hit with a good amount of light and it's going to be a lighter gray. Brown's going to have that same effect, but not to the extreme. So like here is a here's an ant specimen butted up against brown. And once again, the hairs here, even the mites, everything is contrasted really, really well. The wings here are darker, so we're, we've kind of been given an, an advantage. But but I find uh, a brown is, is just an excellent choice. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it, that's a question of aesthetics, kind of personally to you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I definitely there'll probably be some standard background that we do for most things, and then maybe there'll be special use cases. But I guess what I was kind of thinking about is, I've like I in general, like I, I I've kind of tended towards the gray is kind of like the best kind of compromise for most cases. But mm -hmm. at the same time, like what we often do, like for a paper like with a phylogeny or something is try to, you know, cut out the the background and the pin. And that's right. I, th I guess, I mean, maybe it's, it's fine, but I think be especially with like the wings where you get that translucence of whatever the background is, mm -hmm. it has felt to me like white is better, you know, to be able to cut stuff out without there being some, you know, weird different color, you know, behind the wings or in the hairs. Um, and so that's why I've kind of started tending, 
you know, towards white, but, but maybe that's part of this is just my lack of Photoshop skills, um, for, for dealing with, with that. So um, maybe I think, um, I think you will have to use rely on Photoshop a little less if you did put a darker color behind a specimen. I think uh, it's just it's just if the question is to gather detail as much detail as possible. The truth is that some hairs and some of the wings against white are always going to some be somewhat lost just because it doesn't have the necessary contrast. Yeah. So I mean, there are things you can do. So like um, right now, and again, I'm recording, so I can share this with you. But if I were to go to image adjustments, um, typically shadows and highlights um is is the tool that you whoops yeah it, it's curves image um yeah shadows and highlights is the tool that you're going to want to use um automatically it like defaults to 30 percent to bump up shadows but highlights as you'll see we'll start to see see how you, it brings the detail out in the wing almost yeah. instantly and that's at 13 percent. that's really high i would do 10 and then i would almost do like a radius more of like 50 so you're kind of including a little bit more pixels um, and then it's possible where, you know, I actually don't see much, much problems associated with shadows here. There's maybe some darkness, but so honestly, like a 2% bump might help a little bit, but some of the hairs have come back. So this is, that's something that you could do if you did want to continue using white and have this data. But as you start to move towards 3D modeling, you're going to find that you're going to have a nightmarish time trying to develop the wings uh, if they don't have good contrast. Mm -hmm. Um so well, that, that's the main thing. question. I, I remember I, I haven't watched all the 3D modeling in, videos yet, but I did, you know, in the, the, the big B ones, I mean, there was this comment about black background being maybe better for the modeling because it pulls the hairs out, you know, better if they're light colored hairs. And so I was going to ask, like, if that for the 3D modeling, if you always want to go with like the black, you know, the kind of the natural black or, or if gray is okay too. Uh, gray is the, is the standard. Everybody's using gray. Um, so th there actually is a, uh, people are publishing now their workflows, part of Big B, uh, oh. in terms of the settings that they're using. Uh, Adrian Carper at Denver has a really good one. Um, and that's basically public on, I think the, I think I've invited you to the Slack channel. If you uh, navigate to the photogrammetry section of that, inside the Google Drive folder is um, basically the protocol that he has put together uh in terms of how he's doing the imaging a lot of it is extremely consistent with uh with what i present in the big b video the instructions uh however there's a couple of settings that they have modified in order to refine the model uh and there's a couple of things that um you know just clever staging um ideas uh the same stages that we provide but he set them up in a slightly different way to just sort of um basically not have the stage move behind the specimen so things things like that um so I, I would look for that protocol um, and then kind of as you read the, as you kind of move along on the big B videos, um, you know, uh, kind of use that as a resource as well. Um, also that meeting, we have that meeting today at four. Uh, I don't know if you're interested in joining, um, but we, we, we meet and we discuss. Um, so some things I just kind of sit idle on uh, just because it's, it's not related to, you know, my involvement there, but whenever somebody needs help or has an issue with imaging, um, I'm there to talk about it. We have an open discussion every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Um, so you're probably welcome to join that if you want. Um, yeah, I don't know if I could make it today, but I, I would be very interested, especially since there's, I mean, a working group focused on bees specifically, and now we have the system. Mm -hmm. uh, that'd be awesome. Um, and maybe I, I should kind of, I haven't connected with Katja just to let her know that we have it, it's up and running and we'd like to participate. So maybe I'll, I'll do that Yeah, that'd be a great idea. on the Slack channel. I, I guess I haven't connected to it. I found an email where you said, here's the link and I clicked on it, but I'm not quite sure how to get, get let it. me, um, yeah, let me, uh, figure that out real quick. I'll send you the link. Um, one thing too, that you kind of mentioned, uh, just going back to the actual imaging of this, um, while I'm looking for that, uh, okay. Um, is that you said that you turned to the flash and you brightened it. I don't know how bright you went on the flash, but it's it's critical to not kind of go beyond one over eight. Um, one over eight is kind of the max. If you start to get over one over four, what you're doing is you're just gonna, you're gonna drain the batteries way too fast. And it's even better if you can keep it up to one at one sixteenth its output. One over one is a definitely no touch zone. Uh, the, the flash just won't recharge in time. It'll just bleed through the battery power. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
in addition to that, that's where instead of, let's say you have an image and it's still coming out a little bit dark and you've done everything you can to brighten it from the lights, if you kind of find yourself at one over eight, then it's time to start increasing the camera's ISO and that's going to brighten the image. Okay. Um, just don't want to exceed a level of a thousand. And, and, uh, if you have to, then just don't exceed a level of 2000, but you want to, you want to absolutely keep it under 2000. If you can keep it under a thousand, that's even better. So that's, um, the ISO, the ISO, the ISO is an electronic brightening feature and it's, it's destructive. If you use it at high levels, it introduces a lot of noise, but as long as you keep it around a thousand or less, the camera technology is pretty good today that, um, you'll find that it's actually performing pretty well. Uh, in that sense. Okay. Yeah. That's really good to know. Yeah. I, I basically, I mean, I, I was I'm always in a rush, but I was sort of, I wanted to get like, you know, finally get just at least one stacked image that looks pretty good. So I have that kind of understood in my brain. And so I, I kind of rushed through it, but I think I, if for some reason I had to go, I think it was like one over four on the flash units where I adjusted it. So I'll see if, if I can resync them better and then retry it. And hopefully that'll, that'll fix it. Yeah. And I saw in the the video at some point, you know, where you're like, oh, this is a little dark. So the first thing you did was increase the ISO. So I had tried that a little bit, but it didn't, it didn't work. So I probably need to just readjust. Yeah. Yeah. The ISO, you need to jump a little bit. So if it's like a hundred, you might be inclined to like go to 240, but in reality, you should bump it right up to 600 or something. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. The, the jumps are, are like fewer and far between because ISO it's on a scale of like 24,000. It's huge. So yeah. like, uh, as long as you keep it under a thousand, you're okay um good to know yeah i just i went from like 100 to or it's like 160 to 300 and it didn't make too much difference but yeah um the other thing too is um yeah so i think if you play around and get a few more shots and and maybe focus on the iso it'll be a little bit better the other thing to know is you have the usr right yeah so i am there i found the slack invite that's that um the uh what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So I am actually currently in the process of redesigning all of the scale bars and the settings. So in that TPT workflow, the green tables that you see, um, I'm basically redoing all of those for all of the new camera bodies. So it's not out yet, but just know that you can expect uh, basically a new table is going to be coming that shows you a new selection of starting points uh, for the flash, uh, the intervals, and then... Um, you know, the same thing as a green table, but just uh, it's going to be a little bit more well thought out, more complete. The main reason for that is um, when you use a mirrorless camera, when you get into the micro kit, let's say you start working with some really small bees, um, there's a vignetting that occurs naturally around the corners because the aperture of the camera is at f2.8. Like it's, it's pretty open as far as lenses is concerned. However, um, it's not open enough where the corners don't go black. So the way around that is actually to, to crop the image sensor. You have a large camera sensor, it's full frame. So if you just do a 1.6x crop, then you actually get an image. You don't have to worry about any post-processing. You just fit everything right in there and you do a 1.6x crop, but it changes the resolution a little bit. So it will therefore change the scale bars a little bit. So I'm making it so that when people do that 1.6 crop, they have an intuitive scale bar they can just pull in. Uh, and that's almost done. So I'll release that when that's finished. Um, but yeah, for the mo most part, you can still continue using, um, the, yeah, the, the TPT workflow that you have, that's still going to get you to the right place. Okay. Yeah. I was, I, I haven't gotten to the scale bar part yet, but I was, um, curious, I, I, I saw there's a video and maybe it's in the documentation. I didn't see it in the main big B videos, just, you know, discussing the scale bar. I was kind of curious. I mean, I, in terms of like the MPE 165, where you're mm -hmm. you're going from one to five X, I mean, is the scale bar always dependent on which um, magnification you're at? And I guess the one thing I just, that I worry about with the MPE 65 is it's like a continuous turn, mm -hmm. you know, so it's making sure you really standardize, you know, that you're at, you're really at one or two or three X. I wonder if, if there's, you know, guidelines on that because sometimes people use these images like for doing measurements and stuff and Certainly. you really want it not to be you know sloppy yeah um, I, so the um you'll find that the amount of cropping that occurs when you're at a 1x like basically i'll just kind of show you um i got one here somewhere um oh yeah here we go yeah so so 1x is when the image is kind of recalled so basically you can see that when the image is all the way back um that's where the band is around the way. It's right on the yellow line. 
So as long as you're right on the yellow line when you're at the next magnification, like the same yellow line is showing, that's that's where the scale bar has been made. So, um, and even if you were, let's say we were to bump this like plus or minus, yeah, that's going to interrupt scaling, but you're talking about a margin of error that's probably on the orders of a, a, a percent. So like if you have a specimen that's like a millimeter, you know, it might be point, it might be showing as like 0.99 millimeters. And uh, I think that the measurements that happen or occur with that amount of data that's being presented is pretty marginal, but I think it's just important to like all science, maybe just introduce that margin of error as you write it. Um, but if you're much closer, if you're using the micro kit and you have a hair, those, those are actually fixed magnification. So those scale bars are going to be dead accurate. Uh, right. um, and then not only that, but you're at a much, much higher magnification. So even, uh, you know, even to actually consistently scale through that margin of error that's happening at hundred X or 50 X, um, you know, you're talking about looking at the nucleus within a cell, uh, by the time your, your scale bar starts getting off whack, it's pretty close. So that's the important thing to do is just use the mag magnification appropriately according to what you're looking at. And, and when you set the the like the magnification of the lens, are you putting it kind of in, in the middle of the little line or like right at the, you know, kind of right at the line? Yeah, you basically like one X is showing so you can see the whole bar at one X. Uh, it's kind of dark. I know. I'm sorry. Um, but you can see the whole bar is there at one X completely recoiled. So if I'm going to two X now, I'm doing the same thing. And the second, as the second that whole bar is revealed, that's that's just where you want to stop. Okay, all right, yep. good. Yeah, that's those little details. I want to just you know when I make a document about for our group of how to make images and add the scale bar, I just want to be really specific. So that's yeah, that's helpful. definitely. And as I said, everybody's going to get a whole new document with new scale bars and starting settings, and that's going to be helpful for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing, uh, so I think from from here, it's actually really good to just sort of repeat. The method, you know, just kind of as you figure it out, take a few more samples, get really comfortable how the system works, maybe, maybe change the magnification slightly and then go again. Um, and then uh, once you're kind of comfortable there, then I think it might be a good idea to then talk about how you're going to do the field portable system. We could talk about it a little bit today, but I think it's better for you to have a good understanding um, because it could get a little bit more complicated. The problem is, is that when you get into the field, it is going to have to be a little bit more of a... Um, like an in situ operation where, you know, like certain conditions that you're dealing with. And honestly, I freezing bees is going to be, I think that'll be tough. I, but you, you know, that better than me. I don't know how much they'll move even when they're anesthetized. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I definitely want to jump on that a little bit. This is yeah. <laughs> actually, we have some visitors this week that are you know going to help with the field work. And part of the idea was to kind of show them the system. And I was going to, have them, I mean, I could just do the lab system first, but I, I was thinking to, I mean, that might be, maybe that's a better idea um, to get them kind of overall familiar with it. And, but I, I think part of the initial idea was to like, actually say like, here's your backpack, you know, like get, get used yeah, to like yeah. getting it up and putting it away. But I yeah. do think, I mean, so one question I have, cause this isn't really in, in the guide and let me know if there's something that describes it somewhere, but there are these cases, you know, it's so like right now, you know, the, the, the way is to get the best quality image you can with, you know, you know, I'm assuming that the camera settings are done with the idea that you're getting all these, you know, um, images that you're going to stack. But there are these cases, you know, and I think this will be the case in the field too, where I want to prioritize, you know, speed, you know, over mm -hmm. over quality. But, yes. but my my feeling is that with these DSLRs, you know, if you get, you know, the settings right, you know, even a single image. Can have really good depth of field and be a pretty darn good image um you know you know um as compared to say you know your phone yeah. or like through a microscope you know the kind of a crappy microscope camera and so i was wondering if you have any you know general guidelines for like if we want to do a single image of a, a bumblebee or even a small bee like this one you know where it could be like a profile in the label um like what would be the best setting so that that's exactly um uh, yeah so that so that's exactly i think where like where you're going to be going and where you're going to be like, that's, that's the key important thing is. So the way, reason why maybe I suggested that like, it's good to sort of understand and, and shoot at different magnifications is because you're, you're going to start to understand how a camera works. So uh, let me just ask that question. How, how well do you understand the settings of a DSLR and what they, what each function does? So the ISO, the aperture, the exposure. Yeah. I mean, some of these things were like, I, I kind of understand it, but like, I think I, the, like, 
I'm not, I'm definitely no expert, you know, photographer. Yeah. So, but so I that's the thing is you, you will, after a month's use, be an expert because <laughs> you'll, you'll start to change these things independently and you'll understand. But yeah. let me just review them with you right now, because they're important when you take the system into the field. But um, I want to say, I mean, I, I guess you have some sense, like, I mean, I have, we've done chilled bees before and I already have like a DSLR that I've taken for doing kind of voucher images of specimens. And I've had for a while, you know, like my own MPE 65, but I guess, you know, there's a time when I went through all that kind of stuff and I, oh my God, this all makes sense. But I yeah. feel like it always, like it, it, it fades, but like I, but I have these settings, you know, where it's like, okay, I'm in manual. I know that I have, if I have this, you know, flash and this F stop, like I, I get a pretty good image. Yep. But I sometimes forget like, you know, like, like what would be the main things to change or what would be the things definitely not do. Yeah. And so I think just like kind of reviewing that with somebody who has a lot of experience and saying, yeah, these are probably generally good settings. And these would be the things that you would, you would want to change. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to review this with you right now. So, um, yeah. And, and again, like, uh, so it might be good maybe for me to just put this video up on the YouTube channel and then I'll, I can put it in, like, I can put markers of like, this is what we talked about at this time interval. That way you can just navigate to it. Um, okay. but I think in this case, since we are doing focus stacking, let's start with aperture. Aperture okay. f2.8 to f16. Now, th these lenses have different ranges. Some will start at f4, some will go as high as f22, some will go even higher. Now, what the aperture is, is basically the diaphragm within the lens. And um, the lower the number means the more open that diaphragm is, and the higher the number means the more closed that diaphragm is. So, you can imagine if that diaphragm is closing, it's letting a lot less light through. So, you're making the image darker. But the advantage to closing this is that basically you bend light at a more extreme angle and therefore you can resolve a greater depth of field. So in our case, we're not after the greatest depth of field. If let's say that, um, you know, you're looking at something in profile. So you're going to be taking a picture of a subject that's here. And, you know, the picture frame that I'm currently in is going to be representing the depth of that B. So let's say that you have a B and... Um, you know, it fills up this much of the frame. If I'm shooting at f2.8, I'm basically decreasing the focal length, the depth of field, so it's very small. I'm just getting a slice through the head of the B in profile, whereas the abdomen is going to be fully out of focus. And now, the advantage to doing that is the because the diaphragm is completely open, you're letting in so much light that you don't need to bump up the ISO levels to a destructive manner, and you don't need to go crazy on a flash output which could wash out or introduce glare to the shot so um you have a lot more flexibility when you're letting a lot more light in and therefore the quality of that individual focal plane is going to increase substantially whereas if you're sort of using an app this would be basically an aperture of f8 this would be an aperture of like f16 you're getting more of the b in focus here's the abdomen here's the head but if i were to shoot at f22 I got the whole B in focus now, but now because the, the aperture in the lens is so closed, I have to introduce so much light um, that either my exposure has to stay open or my ISO has to be dramatically elevated. So that's where we kind of get into exposure. So the exposure is basically how long that mirror of the camera is going to be open. So if it's one over one, that's one Mississippi and then close. So obviously, if you have a runner or a cyclist running in front of the camera and you have that camera open for, for basically one full second, it's going to be a blur, right? So uh, the cyclist that's going by is going to be completely blurry. So the goal here is to keep the mirror open for a minimal amount of time, but long enough where, again, we're letting enough light in to brighten the image without having to turn to our ISO yet. So <clears throat> if it's 1 over 100, and I think right now the table referred to 1 200, that means the mirror is open for 1 200th of a second. So boom, it's just super fast. Like you can't even blink that fast. It's letting enough light in. It's brightening the image. Uh, and again, we're working with sort of an open aperture because um, we are focus stacking. So we're not so concerned about getting a completely image, uh, the complete depth of field right off the gate, off the bat. Um, but... So that's why, uh, you know, if you're doing astrophotography and you're trying to photograph the night sky, you want a very long exposure if you're trying to capture Aurora Borealis or something like that, because the light is so minimal that you need to leave a long exposure to get those in. But you also have to be cautious of the time interval because the sky is moving on you. So the stars will actually start to blur or streak across the sky. So here again, we're trying to be quick. And um, the quicker we are, 
means the sharper the image because there's less chance for the vibrations of the furnace that's in your building to move the sample in front of the time that the mirror is open. So that's the next step. The third thing that I'm going to talk about before ISO is actually the flash. So the reason why the flash is so critical in is so it basically has a full power mode and that's one over one or ETTL. I always tell people don't ever use ETTL because it's not going to work with the settings. It doesn't understand that the camera is set up for focus stacking. It thinks it's just taking an image. So it's going to just blast a light output. So you basically need the flash to be uh, bright enough, but also understand that the flash is, is also part of the exposure element. So just because the camera or the flash is one over one doesn't necessarily mean it's like the same as exposure. It's not saying, okay, the flash is exposed for one full second. It just means that's full power, one over one power, one half power. So in our case, let's just say one sixteenth. It's one sixteenth the overall brightness intensity. But the flash itself is actually emitting light at like one two hundred thousandth of a second, like very, very quick. In fact, quicker than um, the the camera's mirror is even even doing the shutter. So the mirror is open, um, you know, one two hundredth of a second. And within that one two hundredth of a second, the flash is also basically... Uh, shooting. So it almost makes the mirror look like it's moving in slow motion. And then bam, the flash will fire, illuminate everything, and then the mirror will close. So that also is cutting down on vibration because in addition to the bee sort of being on a vibrational table, the light itself is ensuring that the sample is not moving and it can't blur or streak in any way. So that's where the flash is working with the exposure. So those are sort of the three things three settings to sort of keep in mind. And then the ISO is just say, let's say you're trying to capture any particular image, but you can't get it to the brightness that makes the image look good, or it doesn't show the details that you need. The ISO is the final component where it's more of a digital or an artificial brightening function within the camera that will brighten the image based on, uh, based on the information it already has. And just like if you were to sort of take a file, let's say I were to take like an image and edit it on Photoshop, save it. I think there was somebody that did an exercise a long time ago where they did that. They just saved the photo and then moved the data to a new computer and did that. They did it like 200 million times. And then the image in the end was indecipherable. It was just a blur because the computer, it lost data every single time that it was saved. So um, the ISO sort of does that. As the ISO is, as you introduce a higher number, you are brightening it so intensely that um, you're starting to degrade the quality of the image. And that's essentially what noise is. So if you start, if you take an image at night with your phone or something, you realize it's speckled. That's because the ISO is working over time. So the goal is to keep that ISO as low as possible. So when you're in the field, it's now important to know that, uh, again, the B, you're not just trying to capture the head. You want a single exposure shot of the whole B. So you need to take into account and say, okay, so we're going to have to use um, an aperture of like F11 and, and understand that our light is now going to be restricted. So what is it that we need to do to sort of make sure more light comes in? Now, if your B is frozen, you can get away with uh, a longer exposure. You can leave that mirror open longer and capture a better image, but you have to really make sure that that B is not moving. Um, so that's the first thing. The second is then you can get leverage the flash. The flash is designed so that it can be mounted on there. But then the main concern is that line of sight uh, problem that I always discuss, which is if light from the flash heads is coming into contact with the sample, then you're going to wash it out. It's going to be filled with glare. So you need to diffuse it somehow. And that's where those turtle dove diffusers come into play. So that's, um, I have them, well, at least, yes, yeah, so that's, that's these, they're not perfect, but they're designed to clip directly onto the flash. So what happens is the light will come in, it will hit this shiny surface. The light can't go through this surface. It bounces off this shell, softens the light and then reprojects it on your sample. So these are good, but they're not as good as like the diffuser that we have set up on the current Macropod system. So that's what's going to happen uh, when you're in the field. I recommend sort of using these diffusers uh, and the flash, and then what what you probably also would do in terms of getting set up, just sort of give yourself every advantage of um, of imaging like the specimen is move the camera on top of the stack shot, have a place where you position your bees. Uh, let's 
because that's the other thing. I guess I guess you don't need to take images in situ. You're like you're not trying to get a bee on a flower. You're not going to place it on a flower. You're going to be collecting the bee, putting it on a stage, and then maybe just leave the macropod as it is, uh, and then just move the sample and then just have your settings figured out. So to move forward, I think from like having this information, the first practice that I would do to sort of you know set up your field trial is to place a specimen on the mound as you are right now and basically play around with different apertures. So you, right now you're probably shooting at F4. Try F8. And then I think I actually have a table that shows what it's like when you shoot at F8. So you'll kind of see and you'll get a sense for what changes. You'll get a sense for how much more ISO, how much more flash brightness and so forth. Once you do that, bump it up to F11 and give that a shot. See how much depth you capture at F11. And then once you do that, maybe try a longer exposure time. And then, um, and then, and then also basically introduce a little bit more brightness or a little bit more ISO. And the moment that you start to, to hit a threshold where the image is not good anymore, then you know you've gone too far. So either you've closed the aperture too much uh, or uh, the ISO level has just gotten out of control and you're starting to introduce noise. So does that all make sense? Yeah. Would you still recommend the flash not going um, above 1.8? If you're in the field, that is less of a problem. Uh, the main issue with sort of the flash kind of being controlled at a particular brightness um, for us is because we're focus stacking, we have to get through a series of images. And sometimes, A, you're going to be chugging through batteries, but B, uh, the recharge time. So the flash actually needs to fire, give a, it needs some time to recharge before it can capture the next shot. If you're at one to one, um, it might not recharge in time and then the flash won't fire and then you'll get a black image mixed in with your stack. And that's not good. But if you're taking one exposure, then you're correct. You can basically just leave the flash open at one over one, but just know that now you need to really understand your lighting a little bit more. So let's say you're at one to one, you're using these turtle doves. If these are right up against your specimen, uh, they're going to be uh, basically very bright up against your specimen. So now you need to bring the flash arms a little bit further away. So that way, light has a little bit further to travel. So as it's traveling, it's not just like a laser. It's starting to spread out and become more diffused and soften as it as it reaches the specimen. So those are the, the key things to think about. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of what I thought. I mean, I, so like when I've before now, you know, I've had this DSLR with the MP65 and the twin flash and actually had bought some of your turtle dub diffusers because I like they just snap on. And so I've been doing that for these like kind of voucher images. But the big issue I've had is, you know, I'm all I'm usually just holding the camera and I have found that it works OK, but you definitely see like when you you zoom in like it's not crisp, whereas I have a friend that shoots with a 100 millimeter on a tripod and actually the B like in the picture is really small, but he crops it and it still looks really good. And so I, I guess one of my questions, I mean, so I, I like the idea of using the main, like the same thing as the lab setup with the tripod, you know, uh, on this, you know, kind of angle with the camera mounted, I guess what I'm, I have been uncertain. The, the main thing is I'm kind of uncertain about are like, should we use the MPE 65 versus the 100 millimeter? And then in terms of like how to put the specimen. So I, like the one thing I kind of clicked in my brain is that we use this rotational stage really, that's kind of for like it can be for the stacking, but it's also really for the the 3D modeling because you get the rotation. So in the field, we'll use I guess what is your more the standard mount, I guess. Yeah. And I and that's what I'm just trying to see because it's kind of on an angle. So we'll have this this bee that's chilled. So we generally get like you know a few minutes to five minutes where the bee basically doesn't doesn't move, um, and it can always be rechilled. But the the hope is to sort of get everything set up where. We can sort of quickly put the B in place and all the settings are just right, you know, and we'll take, you know, like, you know, three to four single images that come out pretty good, you know, where we maybe tweak the position of the B a little bit um, and then we're done. Then the B comes off. And in this case, we're going to um, uh, let the bees go. So the idea is that this is this project where the people don't want us killing any bees. So we're trying yeah, to get good cool. images and then letting them go and swabbing some DNA from them potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I'm, I'm excited about, cause I, I mean, I think having this, this, you know, the, the tripod and everything mounted, you know, we'll end up like, you know, once we kind of figure out how to do that, just getting it set up well, it should work great and be much better than me holding my camera as I've done, um, and, and get much better images than like our, our cell phones would. And so that's my yeah. hope. But the challenge is like, how do we, like, what would be the best, you know, I mean, just 
you know, yeah, just lens camera and then also stage set up for these chilled bees, you know, that will, you know, it could maybe use some putty or something, but they won't be on a pin. Yeah. Maybe a way to kind of, there could be a way to sort of get them on a, you know, like, you know, stick them on a pin somehow, you know, you know, and I guess pull them I off. Think... I think it's some way to do that, but I've usually just put specimens on like a paper plate and you know, taking a picture from That's above. I think what I would do, or I would actually continue to just use the box um like a, oh. a little box and then uh have it on there so i will tell you that the, the only the only project that i've ever endeavored that was similar to what it is you're trying to do is snowflake photography so obviously oh. snowflakes have to stay in situ um because um well first of all if you touch them they melt instantly so you, know, you have to take the system outside and you have to do it in sub-zero mm -hmm. temperatures um and we were able to get good images uh and um the only advice I would have is let's say that, um, well, a couple things. One is um, I would continue to use the Macropod's current configuration. That's what I had always done when I was in the field. Um, and the tripod, to answer your question, is going to give you leaps and bounds greater image. Because the thing is, is uh, if you're doing handheld, there's no way that the camera's not moving uh, no matter what your exposure is at. So you need to be at like one, two thousandth at a handheld in order for it to freeze everything. And that's simply just not enough light at the macro scale. So um, so a tripod is going to allow you to leave that longer exposure. And also it's going to keep everything more stable and introduce less motion. And therefore the quality of the image will be crisper. So the tripod is, dire is, is directly the reason why your friend was able to get better images uh, over the handheld. So you have that leg up now. The, uh, the, the recommendation that I would make instantly is that understanding your specimen sizes is to use 1x magnification only on the MPE 65 if you're going to use it. I would stay away from going to 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x. Uh, I would just leave it at 1x. You're going to get a good image. And it's really kind of, that would honestly be my preferred lens to use simply because you can figure out where the focal plane is in advance and just leave everything completely set up, place your B, take the picture and move on. Whereas the 100 millimeter, you could do the same thing, right? Like, so you can figure out your working distance and you can figure out what your depth of field is going to be and then turn the lens off so that basically it's on a manual focus, just like the MP65. However, there are times maybe where the bee is starting to wake up and you're like, you didn't get that last shot and you need to get an image real quick just to complete your data set. That's where possibly having the autofocus feature in the 100 millimeter is going to be an improvement or a leg up. So... So I, I think those are the two things to kind of consider for you. Um, I would maybe start at 1x. If you go to 2x, I guarantee you're going to have a bad day. <laughs> so stay at 1x. And then uh, if you find that uh, the depth of field or maybe the image cropping is just a little off at 1x, then that's the time to maybe shift to the 100 millimeter and figure that lens out. Um, and then just know that maybe it's beneficial or in your interest if you're using the Macropod setup to keep it in manual focus, not in autofocus. And then if it starts to move on you, then real quick, switch it to auto and just capture an, a picture in auto mode and call it a day on, on that. So that's what I would, that's what I would recommend uh, in that case. Um, the yeah, flash yeah. would basically be the, the wireless flashes on the arms and really just pointing directly at the stage. You but in this case, it. It's without the shroud. Um, but with yeah, the you can do it on the arms, but I actually, I think it came with a mount too that allows you to mount it directly on the front of the lens as well. Yeah. So would that be better? That that uh <laughs> I don't think it's better, but I think it I think in the beginning it's gonna be easier. Yeah, I think I think actually having the arms and moving your lights away and being able to manipulate light with the arms is gonna be ultimately better. So that's probably the best. Um, but yeah, just know that if you switch to a handheld position, then a let the lens mount is gonna be the better option. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, and this is the part like for the, I haven't, this is what I wanted to look at before this meeting, but the other stage. So I like, I mean, the box like you have with some cotton might actually work really well, where even if it's, you know, so the specimen, I just, cause it's not like, I mean, this is what I don't quite see is like, will the specimen be, you know, on a flat surface or will it be more like the, the box is vertical and we're sort of trying to hold the specimen in place, like on the cotton or something. I actually think the cotton's actually going to be a good idea too, because one is because it's so depth, like so much depth 
um, it's not going to illuminate really bright. The light is going to be diffused as it goes through it. So uh, that's going to be good for that reason. One thing that Devox is really good for is that when you stage your specimen, if your lights are down here, kind of where the brackets are designed to be, uh, there's that if you'll notice under the stack shot, there's a bar. And there's two clips that also came with your system that allow you to mount the flashes directly right down there. Um, that's actually a great setup. So like, um, kind of look at our older videos, just the Macropod Pro 3D and see how we set up our lights. You might want to mimic that. Um, but what you're using then is you're using this outer edge of the box to block the light from coming in the line of sight with the sample. So this might be a little deep. I might actually just cut this in half and stick it back in there. But almost guaranteed the way that this is all wiry is that the hairs from the bee are going to just grab this. And you might even be able to just put a bee on there and it's just going to stay fixed. So this actually might be a really good way to position your bee uh, is to just use a, a sample a jewelry box um, and then just give that a shot. I think that would probably be pretty good. Yeah. And say so we could even sort of cut, I mean, if we needed a little hole out of the cotton, so it'd be sort of, you know, set the specimen in there. Yeah, yeah just, I mean, if it's not if it's vertical or on an angle it's the only thing is i don't you know we it's we don't want it to fall out and ideally we want to get sort of like a profile and mm -hmm. be a, like a ventral dorsal and face you know that's hopefully awesome. we can see whatever the characters are so it's it needs that's something a great that, idea yeah i would i would do that i would just take this and just plug pull a plug out and then um and then set the, it set to be inside of it i think that's a great idea that might be that might be the easiest <laughs> easiest way to do it so and yeah, yeah it hadn't occurred to me. Yeah. Does that box, does it just in the in the other stage, does it just sort of like rest there, yeah. kind of 90 degree angle? It's not like it attaches. And in this I apologize. I just haven't worked through this yet for a while. I just I know we have the other stage and um... Yeah, so so there's a couple things. Um I don't know if you had this stage, these are actually pretty new. Um, but this is the rack and pinion stage that you have. I just have uh, something else mounted to it. It's a slide mount. Um, but basically the L plate, what I'll do is I'll take the dental wax that we buy, just put a little bit on the bottom here, and then you just basically stick it, just stick it right on the stage. Um, and then what's actually the kind of nice about these stages. So I made this black stage and actually I'll, I might just send you one of these because what's really nice is, um, these are actually designed to function the same way the edges of the box are. If I were to place a sample here, this stage will block the direct light from coming up and hitting the sample. Um, and what I do is this is the bar here where the lights, the flashes mount to, because then the flashes, what they do is they're placed behind this bar. They shoot up towards the front of the lens. They, they bounce off the, the lens diffuser and then reproject onto the sample. But the dimensions are here such that I can actually just pinch the box in and then it stays in place. So then you don't even need any tack or anything. So I think what I can do is actually, um, I just made these new stages uh, like these. These are actually designed to be placed on top of the universal stage. So there's a couple of threaded holes at the bottom. This can be placed right on the universal stage. It can hold your box in place just like that. And it's pretty snug. And then um, the real advantage here is the reason why it was made isn't necessarily for placing specimens, but it's for slides. So it converts the system into a microscope. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's pretty neat is a lot of people with a microscope, um, you can use the analyzer to reproject light so that it hits the specimen more obliquely. So like if you're looking at Hymenoptera and you look at look through it, you, you don't see much. But if you hit it with uh, oblique light, then all the cells start to show up. So it's left open purposefully at the bottom like that. So that way you can shine light through that window. And that gives it that effect of oblique light. And then all the cells, you know, you see that relief in the slide. So that's what that's for. So um, I'll just send you one of these. And I think that's going to be helpful. So the universal mount, that's the rotary mount? Yeah. Yeah. So they, um, so I, I think mine's, mine might be in use. Um, yeah, here we go. So basically the holes in the bottom of the universal stage, this one, they line up perfectly with the holes here and you can basically just thread thread it right through and then you can you can position this right on top of the universal stage without having to configure the system so that could be an option for you as well mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um yeah so i think that's a good idea <laughs> yeah and so the other the stage you just showed me mm -hmm. those do those um the uh, the 
the dials, do those move it up and down vertically so you can adjust the height to get the specimen like in the right position for the camera? Is they that do. right? It's okay. an X, Y stage. It's a, it's a beautiful stage for that reason. It basically functions the same way, um, you know, the, the lens analyzer would under a microscope. It allows you to move the X axis and the Y axis in a panoramic fashion to find your specimen. So the only thing it doesn't do is the, the rotary part, which is why we have that one for the 3D. That's right. It doesn't do the rotary part, but I don't think you would want the rotary part if you're doing this in the field with frozen bees. I right. think that would be too cumbersome. Yeah. I was just, I mean, I was just kind of thinking, um, well, if we're, if we're in the lab, mostly doing, like, say we're doing a bunch of things, it's just the 2D, like, mm -hmm. are there advantages to just using the, the XY stage? Um, I think there are, I, I think there are, um, honestly for Hymenoptera, that's what most of my specimens are doing. Uh, I mean, sorry, most, most of my clients are doing, they're, uh, they're using the objective in the XY stage. Um, but, uh. So like that's been that that was basically kind of intro macropod back in 2013. Um, it was a very useful stage for isolating and finding your specimens quickly. Um, the universal stage didn't really come about until 3D modeling became a uh, necessity. And then the reason for the universal stage was to basically function like a gimbal. Uh, universal stages were so expensive, nobody made them. So then eventually I had to make them. And then once we found, um, once we put that little, little light shroud around it that, that I made, found out that that was actually giving us such good light that just sort of started to standardize the universal stage and it rendered the XY stage a little bit more obsolete. But um, that universal stage is not for everything. You can't put a butterfly on there. You can't put large specimens on there. So that's where the XY stage is going to be more useful. And I think that these um, in situ like field applications, again, that's where um, the XY stage is going to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of thinking like, so if we, if we were going to do like in the lab, but single images and something where we want the specimen and the label that that X, Y stage might be better with the box where you could put the pin in and maybe put the labels, you know, position some way that, that would, you could get those two. So I was, yeah, I was kind of thinking about that. I did find, I mean, just with the universal, just getting the specimen you know, like I'm used to using like clay where I can kind of tweak all the angles just right. And with, with that one, I just found it, especially once it's in there, you know, a little hard to sort of manipulate it, you know, just how oh, I, yeah. it can, so. it can take a minute to figure out how to use that stage for sure. Um, but once you have it, you'll find out you just have a lot of flexibility. If you just have a standard pin or point mount. Yeah. 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 Um, it's great. Um, Oh, yeah. So I, one other question. So I was curious. Um, I know, um, I mean, part of the reason, I guess, when I was doing a lot of the imaging before in the field and I just handheld my cameras, because that's what Alex Wild, who did a lot of ant photography, would do. So it's kind of mimicking him. And it was sort of a surprise when I saw this other colleague doing bees with the tripod. And I guess part of it's because Alex is always imaging, you know, live moving ants, which go really fast. And I guess my my bee colleague, you know, he's kind of done the same thing of like knocking bees out with CO uh, with like a, a spray canister or chilling them, but kind of waiting to where they're just about to wake up and fly away. So they look alive. Um, and so that's why, you know, he's been able to sort of I mean, that's kind of what we want to do with this. I guess this this new project is is have them chilled and not moving. So I think the tripod will will, will work well. But I've noticed a lot of people that do the handheld ant imagery, you know, it seems like a really popular diffuser now is this. Cygnus Tech diffuser. I'm sure you've mm -hmm. you know seen those. And I was going to ask what you thought of you know that style versus the the turtle doves you know mounted onto the system. Yeah, I think I think it's just important to remember that they ultimately all do the same thing. They're emitting light within a particular you know short frame window while the mirror is open in the camera. Um, the thing about like you know Alex is you know Alex is like the you know, he, he's not just like a, a driver or a car, you know, that has a car, like a license. He's like an F1 driver. You know, he, he knows what he's doing. He's been doing it yeah. for a very long time. And, and so like to kind of go in, it is kind of like somebody that just got their driver's license and throwing them in like an F1. So like, um, so that could be one of the reasons why it could be that simple. It's just, he has a really good understanding of his settings and his technique and his method that, that maybe there's something underlying where the method is more difficult to replicate. Um, the i think did you when you were using handheld setup i'm assuming you had a flash on there right because you said you had the turtle doves yeah i mean i yeah. 
back in the day, I mean, I was always had, I've had the twin flash or the MP65. And for a while, I tried to kind of mimic what Alex did with this sort of makeshift thing with diffusion paper and clips to get around the flash. And mm -hmm. I bought some other, you know, kind of clip on things that didn't work well. And then your turtle dove ones that I bought, you know, about a year ago have definitely worked a lot better. And I've, I've been using those just because I, I didn't like having all this contraption that took a while to get on and was, yeah, yeah. But I have felt like maybe the light overall, and this could just be my inexperience or, you know, or lack of skill tends to be a little bit harsher than, you know, than some of the, you know, you know, bigger diffusers I've seen. Um, but I haven't done any direct comparisons. I know that makes complete sense. Yeah. Because there's a, a fully open window on these, like the trick isn't actually to point the diffuser at the sample. If, if I were to do that, you can see how the window starts to open. It's possible that maybe the light is hitting the sample. So the trick is to actually bend them away. So actually, yeah. yeah, so that could be is you want to angle them away. And I think some people that get confused with these is they don't realize that, that you're, you're actually trying to pull light away. Because if you think about like a handmade contraption where the light diffusion is all around the camera, like you can get the light perfect. If you, you know, you can go a long way, use a lot of paper. It looks really ridiculous. But um, the point is you can get light to do exactly what in your mind you need it to do. And here you can't, like you can certainly diffuse light uh, in a way where it's going to be an aid, but you still need to understand that it's important to get the light a little bit more soft. And therefore, it's important to maybe pull these a little bit further away from the material than have them right up against the sample. Um, yeah. So like, that's why, that's why even when you use the macropod setup in the lab, I don't recommend that these are be these be used because you have a lot more flexibility with the lens mounted diffuser. And then the globe, it's sort of well thought out and designed to function as a system together. Whereas this you have to understand what light is doing and um, this will work. It's certainly going to take the glare away, but it's not going to be, it's no way going to be as perfect as somebody sitting there meticulously, you know, making light do what they need it to do. So that that's the important thing to point out uh, with these. So they're going to work, but you just have to understand what it's doing and then work with it in a weird way. Yeah. My B colleague who was using the 100 millimeter, his initial setup was, putting the specimens on a paper plate in a light box, but then, you know, using arms, but putting the flashes in, but shining them, you know, away from the specimen just towards the light box mm -hmm. and like, having that broad illumination. And then he's since, I guess, has switched to the, the Cygnus tech, tech one. And he said he kind of likes his, like it's easier with the Cygnus one, but he liked the lighting of the light box better. Um, yeah. I, yeah. So yeah, th this is great. I mean, I think, you know, again, we're not <laughs> part of it, you know, yeah. we're not in the sealed case looking for like the ultimate best images, but just no. something that's standardized and fast, but produces images that are much better than, yeah, again, like our cell phones, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I think everything yeah. you've talked about. You're going to do, you're going to, so I can think as long as you kind of recommend the, uh, like, I think understanding those settings is key. That's first. Actually, if you were to take this out and image snowflakes, you'll know what you need to do for the bees. Um, like, almost instantly it's actually might be a good exercise if there's snow around right now um but the other thing i just want to do i'm going to share my screen again because so in here this is you know this goes back to 2013 back when the company was being formed <clears throat> but we've like in situ so for here this is um yeah this was like me doing a handheld image of like the face of a turtle right so the turtle face is going to be somewhat similar to um oh yeah you know the face of like you know, like a whole B and that, that me, that handheld shot wasn't like a good shot until basically I mimicked the macropod. I set the macropod up outside. I grabbed the turtle and I literally put it in front of this, of the macropod the same way I would have done, um, you know, a B specimen and I'm not sure why I'm so zoomed in here, but, um, if I were to go to like the reptile album, actually, yeah, almost everything in here is, uh, is live so this is that handheld shot and it was the best i could do whereas mounted to the macropod and using the settings you know these were images i could get of like its eye um much much more detail and again pretty crisp not as crisp as a focus stacked image but and here this is actually going to be a particular this is actually a really good exercise because it's showing you the depth of field so you can see i've, I've obviously have a pretty big aperture and because this was a single shot it's going to show me i used the MPE 65. The ISO was at 3200. Um, exposure was one over 100. I did not use a flash. So I was obviously disadvantaged. If I used a flash, 
I probably could have got the ISO to a, down to a thousand, but I didn't want to use a flash because I didn't want to harm the turtle. <laughs> so that's that's why uh, it could have been better if there was a flash in play. And then the aperture here is f16. So these are settings that I think that you could probably um, yeah, probably sort of mimic because uh, and this is right on my Flickr page. You just navigate to the Reptile album, take a look at these settings, because I think that depth of field is going to be adequate for a B. Uh, you can see how the nose is a little out of focus and the neck is a little out of focus, but the majority of the head is is there. So, um, and here, uh, this one, I, I think I took more time because I saw that the nose was, oh no, this one I actually did try and focus stack, I think. So, and this is something that you could potentially do too. So let's say that the depth of field in a particular B is not quite um, matching uh, to like the aperture that you have set. You could also just, make the aperture f12 uh still have a very long depth of field and, and change it over and get two shots or three shots rather than 40 shots and that might allow you to focus that but you can see here um the reason why i did this and i think i used a flash is because i noticed his eyes were closed so I, <laughs> I didn't want to bother him but you can see his eyes were also moving and therefore there's a bit of a blurry spot around the eyes um settings down here so this was definitely a stacked image because the exit files uh for the camera settings is missing and back at this time zarine stacker did not preserve the original exif data so i don't have the camera settings for this um today it does <clears throat> uh, yeah so so this is this is a textbook example uh this was an image as well this was a uh, single exposure through the eye of like a crusty gecko so yeah I, and this was in a Macropod configuration. So I think it's, I think if you stick along with the Macropod configuration and know that you just need to, to close the aperture and then sort of supplement the bright, the loss and brightness, you're, you're going to, you're going to be getting professional grade, very good quality shots doing what you're doing. So that did remind me, I mean, so for, so using the MPE 65 in the field um, for focusing, I mean, I guess I wasn't sure if I, if we would take the stack shot out and have that basically attached to a battery and we would use that because the mp65 you know you can't it doesn't actually have a manual focus right you're, you're just sort of you know you have to move the camera or the specimen yeah but you wouldn't want it to if you're constantly having to um rely on uh like let's say if you if you wanted to rely on an autofocus your settings are going to be changing and therefore you might be further from the specimen than you realize or closer to the specimen than you realize like that that could be good if you're used to it. But if you're gonna have the macropod in a stage like where you're shooting at the X, Y, your foc your your focal distance is gonna be almost methodical because the the box that's mounted on the stage is gonna be the exact focal plane away from where your lens is. So at F16, you might be capturing the whole box in focus. So you just place your B, snap your shot, and move on. Okay. That's yeah. good. So I was just thinking like if there are those little tweaks of like, oh, you have a you know specimen's a little bigger or it's just this one falls in a slightly different spot. Like, well, we need to tweak that a little bit or it really be like we set it up, we get it kind of basically in the right spots and then yeah. we should be good to go for all the specimens without having to move it. So are you, are you saying, so you think we we, we probably don't, because I mean, I, that's what I was thinking is that we wouldn't need to bring the stack shot controller. It would just be really the tripod. Well, I, I would still bring the, I would leave the stack shot position up, like on there because um it's like, for example, you might have a different size B and you want to crop it differently or something like that. So like the, I, you would, I would just use the stack shot, not necessarily for focus stacking, but in order to find your focal plane faster, that's what I would do. So like if I were doing snowflakes and I knew time was of the essence because I knew it was going to melt, like mm -hmm. what I would do is I'd leave the stack shot on there and then I would just use the stack shot controller to quickly find my focal plane. Um, it's going to be good for that reason. So I would leave it on there. Okay. So it'll yeah. be the and by stack shot, I mean it's it's the you know the translational mount and the controlling box, and that would be attached to a, I guess a battery then, which it comes with, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So you have a battery with your system. You'll just plug it in there, and and that'll that that'll last all day. Actually, that that thing will last four days. <laughs> yeah. So it's a it's good supply. Okay. Awesome. I I think that answers everything, and now I just need to go play with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the last thing I was going to ask you is actually, so a colleague of mine was saying they need to buy a new imaging system and they were going to, they were going to replace, I think, a, a, an older like auto montage system. Um, but the, I guess I mentioned the macropod as a possibility. 
Um, but their concern was that they're doing um, specimens in liquid, you know, like spiders um, oh, yeah. and that thing. And so I, I assume that's something you guys have dealt with because I know that the protocol yeah. I have says pinned and or in liquid. Um, mm -hmm. They have a Keonce too, but she said that they've had issues there where it's hard for them to get, you know, the positioning just right because they don't have a microscope. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's some of those things that, you know, regardless of your system is always a challenge, but I was. Yeah, these are all aquatic. And okay. um, like this is aquatic uh, batch of like an egg clutch from a squid. And this is actually a terrific album to clue them into because this is actually a video with our system of one of the squid hatching. This <laughs> is how we manage our liquid specimens. So these are squid inside a crystal cuvette. And these are alive. So this is actually a focus stack live image of one of these little squid down here. <laughs> um, but yeah, things in a solution we have really well figured out and shared a method with many people for people that are shooting through alcohol um, that that I think, uh, I don't think that they, they'd have an issue. In fact, like if they understand the method, they'll probably be very happy. Um, so, I mean, feel welcome to share, share our information. But some people like they just they like what they have done. This whole album here is um, specimens in alcohol. These are salamanders through alcohol shot with fluorescence. This is a cleared and stained specimen. No, something else that's that's really advantageous with our system is because it's <clears throat> we're shooting on a horizontal plane, we have the ability to adjust any color in the background to add that contrast. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, so this is, this is a specimen, this is an egg. This is a either a salamander or a frog egg. I can't remember where there's a symbiotic relationship between the algae and the embryo, and they don't know how the algae gets inside the egg. So it must be sort of given by the mother. Um, and here is the egg, like basically in an alcohol. So you can basically see all the algae and the specimen, the embryo inside the egg. So we we we've, we've I've, there's been a lot of time spent on capturing images in out in solutions, and I think. Uh, I think it's worth just sharing this uh this album or this uh this page with them. I'll just yeah. show in the uh let me just see. I lost it. Zoom. I'll just share yeah. this in the chat. And then yeah, have them look through different albums and take a look at our our wet specimen albums. Yeah, I think they're I mean they're mainly doing, you know, like spiders and arachnids and alcohol. And I think maybe the main concern is just the positioning to get like the key images mm -hmm. and how how to keep it in the right place, you know, for the image. Um, yep. I have a ton of tricks <laughs> that, that I can share. Uh, yeah. And in fact, so what I, like I said, I'll, I'll share this video on my YouTube channel. And if you want to share this section with them, um, uh, that might be good, but so I'll share this screen again briefly. Um, but there's a caddis fly section we did. This goes way back. Our uh, solution, our shooting through solutions has, has been changed since then. Uh, but like they I will improve, should I say, uh, but one thing you could do is take, uh, your crystal cuvette or whatever you're shooting through and put a piece of paper at an angle. And what I find is the texture of the fiber of the paper is enough to grab it. You know, you're going to, you're going to see this with the cotton in your bees when you're shooting in the field and you can position your specimen against the piece of paper that's at an angle at almost any, any angle. So it's really comes very easy to manipulate your specimen. Some people try hand sanitizer or gels. Problem is you get bubbles. It honestly, it's it's more more struggle than it's worth. So I honestly I shoot right in a solution, right in water. Um, or and I've never had an issue. And kind of some testaments to this is the pollen grain album. This is actually pollen. This this engineer was interested in how pollen grains uh function at the air water interface. These are actually pollen grains floating on the surface of water, focus stacked at i think 50x magnification and we were moving the water this is actually the water and the pollen is mounted to the stage that's on top of the stack shot and you can see there's no movement mm -hmm. so uh in between picture frames we actually get pretty good detail there um and i have there's some other examples of things in a solution but um other videos and things this hydrozoa album this was uh this is a focus stacked image um of uh, just basically lake water is what that is. And then we have a few more uh, like that as well, but it, it shouldn't be an issue. I, I, I'd i have them just look through here and take a look at our aquatic specimens and pay attention to the age. Like this was shot in 2014. This was a year after the company launched and we were trying to figure things out. If you were to take a look at some of the aquatic specimens we've done in the last five years, um, the methods we have implemented are just, they're, they're so much better.
um, if you kind of navigate to the photo stream, um, this is basically the most recent images are going to be shown first. So you can kind of pour through here and see what you see. Um, a lot of these are going to be pinned. Some of them are just somebody brought me a sample and they wanted to see something. Um, but there's going to be, a, this is this is same thing. This is a Petri dish culture of uh, funguses that are developing, uh, that are uh, couldn't be contaminated to the air. So they were also in an enclosed container. Um, but yeah, I would have them look through here. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I think this is awesome. And uh, yeah, I have to run. I have to go pick up my kid yeah, from. Yeah, same. So yeah. All your yeah. <laughs> well, this was a good chat. And then, um, yeah, if you need anything, don't hesitate to ping me. I can jump on again. And uh, I guess good luck. Keep me posted. Okay, great. I will. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. Take care. Bye. Yeah.